We all talk about getting a bug when we get sick, but what about real creepy crawly bugs that we encounter, good and bad? The bugs that bug us tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. We tend to lump a lot of creepy, crawly critters into the category of bugs. In truth, there are bugs, arthropods, arachnids, and beetles, just to name a few. In the next hour, we'll talk about how some bugs are bad for us, some are good for us, and some are just fellow travelers on this earth. But first, let's take a look at this week's quiz question. True or false? Ticks are insects related to the mosquito that can jump out of trees to land on humans innocently passing by. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays, originally written for this show, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show, but you only have 10 minutes to get your quiz question answer in. We will answer all your questions about bugs, though, as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight uh, as a, an old friend, been here many times, Dr. Paul Johnson, an entomologist, a PhD doctor at South Dakota State University, and Dr. Ferris Massanat, who is at Avera Medical Group, infectious disease specialist from Sioux Falls. This is a great combination. This is an infectious disease guy and a bug guy, and we're going to talk about bug vectors and infections that go together, you know. So, Let's talk about that. What, uh, let's talk with you first, Paul. What attracted you into entomology? Well, I really don't know. I've always uh, played with insects ever since I was flea high to a knee, so it's, uh, it's just something that's been part of my life. Um, they're just, I find them fascinating creatures, and, and uh, they do quite well on six legs, and, and they're just the huge diversity of them. Uh, with 80% of the life forms on planet Earth, are insects. Eighty percent of life forms in the known universe are insects. So Isn't that it's, amazing? It's just, and some of them were here at the very beginning. Oh, well, I don't know about the very beginning, but very close to the very beginning. They, the, their fossil history goes back almost 500 million years. And they so. predict that when everybody else is wiped out, there will still be insects. Well, there's still some people that think the cockroaches will inherit the earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Ferris, you're, you're originally from where? From Jordan. It's a small country in the Middle East. Right, right. And then you, you went to med school there? I did my medical school there, and then I went um, to the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, I did my internal medicine residency and then my infectious disease fellowship over there. And then I came to South Dakota in 2009, and um, I'm having uh, fun still. So, so you, this is a different environment than you were raised. It's uh, slightly different in, in some aspects. Um, some, some things are, are very basic, and uh, they're very similar uh, between South Dakota and Jordan. So I noticed certain things like... Like what? Uh, like family values, for example, or uh, staying connected to, uh, to your family, having uh, cousins, uh, and staying in touch with them. Things like that, I noticed it maybe a little bit more in, in South Dakota than some other places in the country. So I, I like that aspect about living here. Gee, I do too. I think that's a nice compliment about South Dakota. Oh, sure. But so, infectious disease is your specialty. Yes. Well, is there something about Jordan and that it went, brought you that way, or when you were in Arizona is when you decided? Yeah. What was it that brought you into infectious disease? Um, just to, do, during my internal medicine residency, I noticed uh, that the cases were there. There was a strong infectious disease presence. Uh, they were more uh, interesting that usually behind each infection there's a story. Why did that person get that specific infection? Um, we are all exposed to so many viruses, bacteria, fungi. On uh, Every day we are exposed to these uh, things. Why does one person get that infection and a whole lot 
of others do not. No. Uh, why do two people get the same infection, get sick with it, but one recovers very quickly and the other does not? So there are so many interesting aspects about those. Right. And one of the th questions that I have, I know you're really busy right now in Sioux Falls. I mean, right now the hospital's full of infection. It is. Is it related to the uh, influenza, do you think? Yeah, the winter season, usually it's busy all, all over the country. Uh, I talk to my friends uh, who are doctors in different places in the country. In the South, too? Uh, in, yeah, in, 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 South, in South Dakota, in California, in Arizona, and they're always busy in the winter. Um, there's more influenza. There's more common colds. And when you get a virus um, that infects your respiratory tract, especially influenza, sometimes you see complications from it. Uh, uh, you get the virus first, and then you can, you can get a bacteria, uh, such as a staph or a strep, that can cause a pneumonia, and you can get sicker and get admitted to the hospital. Right. So we're seeing more of that. And it can kill you. It can kill you. It can kill you. Um, any comments about influenza that you should say about prevention? Because I think we'll, get, we'll go there right now before we get more into vectors. It's and, not insects. It's not <laughs> insects, is it? It is not. It's yeah. not carried. the bugs for the bugs. It can't. It isn't out. Uh, any preventive issues? The, the best way to prevent it uh, is maintaining good hand hygiene and taking the vaccination. Even this season, the vaccination was a huge disappointment. Um, we don't know exactly the efficacy rate. It's going to be less than 30% for sure. Uh, but I tell people, if you're going to get hit by a car and there's a 10% chance of preventing it by taking a vaccine, would you do it? And, and people will say yes. Um, I would take the vaccine. Uh, if you haven't taken it yet, I would advise you to take it. Um, the vaccine is uh, is is usually very safe. Uh, there are very specific precautions where you should not get it, but for over 99% of people, uh, it's safe for them to take the vaccine. And, and I've gotten the, the quadruple four times yeah. stronger because I'm older than 60, 65, whatever that cutoff is. Yeah. Is that a good idea? Some, some folks who are over uh, 60 need to take uh, the vaccine twice uh, in order to produce um, a good effect of the vaccine. Taking it once is still better than nothing. Um, the, there's, um, there are many strains of the influenza, and that's why, why, why is the efficacy 70% in one season and only 15% on another season. Uh, the virus is very smart, and we always say sometimes the virus is smarter than humans. And you get the best scientists, um, the experts with influenza, um, and they try to come up with the best uh, design for the vaccine. They usually do this um, um, a few months before the vaccine is manufactured. It takes some time to, mm -hmm. to make the vaccine. And they, made, they make the vaccine, and the vaccine starts mutating afterwards. So you get a completely okay. uh, different virus that, where the vaccine doesn't cover you. Right. Uh, the good part is that probably next season they will adjust for this, and they will include um, these mutated viruses right. in, in the next vaccine. So they predict pretty well as usual, but the, uh, but not this year, not as good as this year. This year wasn't that great, yeah. So any comments about illnesses in the winter from bugs? And I mean, some would say, why did we do this show in, in February? But the answer is bugs are with us all the time, they, but they, when, when we really need to know this information, it's often too late, so. Well, well there's that, but also the latitudes and climate we live under now. Uh, there just is not the uh, disease vectoring insects active uh, this time of the year to a large degree. The main problem this time of the year are indoor uh, bugs, not necessarily insects, that can cause problems such as dust mites, for example. Right. Uh, and uh, that kind of allergy from yeah, the dust and, mites. And people oftentimes change uh, things like house cleaning habits during the winter because of the different their own behavioral changes as the season changes. Right. And so with the houses locked up, humidity comes up, uh, maybe the carpets aren't getting shampooed often enough. Um, you can have things like dust mites build up and, and a lot of people will have allergic reactions to those. Yeah, I, so. I, so I've heard, I heard, you know, of course we get so dry in the, in the summer that we should, uh, or in the winter, that we should really humidify the house. Well, then I changed my mind on that one about 20 years ago because Dust mites flourish in the humidity, correct? They do, but you can have very dry air conditions in the house, but down in the carpet, in the rugs, in the floorboards, behind the walls, 
there's still plenty of humidity down there. So what do you recommend for dust mites? To How would we get rid of them or control them? You can never totally get rid of them. The best thing is just to keep a good sanitation habit. So periodic, and especially if you have pets and children where there's a lot of dander and hair that's building up. Children, you know, yeah, they, they do just about like the the dogs do. Too. They do. The they do, and they're rolling around <laughs> on the floor too. So basically, keep things clean. You know, don't don't last like food products. Don't let them sit down in the carpet. Uh, vacuuming, shampooing periodically. Change your your bedding uh, frequently. Uh, basically, just keep. You don't have to sanitize everything. Just just keep everything normally clean, uh, and that keeps them at a low enough population that if you're living with them and you don't have any special problems, they will adapt to you and you will adapt to them and you'll never know that they're there. So, so. now I've heard that if we didn't have dust mites to eat away the, the pieces of skin that we shed, then the world would fill up with skin particles. I mean, of course, that's ridiculous. But what? I don't know about that. But Is there I a joke good with, thing? I joke with my students sometimes that if it wasn't for dust mites, the world would get overrun with dust bunnies under the bed. Dust bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Why are doctors constantly reading about medicine and diseases? Because one day it will be important <clears throat> when a patient walks in with something they've never seen before. This started, I was at a convention in Duluth, Minnesota for several days in June and came home. Um, when I was at the convention, I had to walk to the convention center from my hotel it was about three blocks, and I walked through a city park on a sidewalk. When I came home, um, about seven days later, I developed a fever. And I thought that it was probably just the beginning of a cold or something like that, but it continued to get worse, and that was on a Wednesday when it started. The following Monday, I thought maybe I should have it checked out. So I, my primary provider was not available, so I went and saw another physician and she thought that it was probably West Nile. So they tested me for West Nile and said they'd let me know the, the um, results and I had been taking Tylenol and Advil alternate, alternating and to continue doing that as there is no treatment for West Nile. Um, the fever continued to rise, um, a lot of fatigue, uh, just not feeling well at all and chills and by Wednesday of that week, they called and said, well, it's not West Nile. And I said, well, what is it? And they didn't know. And so I waited some more, hoping it would just resolve and be viral and be gone on its own. And it did not. So that Friday, I went back into Avera Clinic and saw another physician. And after doing extensive lab work and x-rays, chest x-rays, as they were looking for possibility of pneumonia, um, through my lab work, she realized that I had ehrlichiosis. Ehrlichiosis is a bacterial infection that you get from the Lone Star Tick. She initially asked me if I had traveled, and I would assume she meant outside the country, somewhere exotic, and it wasn't, it was to Duluth. And when I told her that, she was like, you have ehrlichiosis. And I said, well, how do you know that? And she said, your symptoms show it, and I read about it a week ago. I was the first case they'd ever seen at Avera Clinic, possibly the first case in South Dakota. And it is from the Lone Star Tick, which is not in South Dakota yet, luckily, but probably will get here. And it is a tick the size of a head of a pin, and it gets on you and infects you, and then gets off, you never even realize that it was there. And so it wasn't like I was looking for a tick to scrape off or anything like that. And so um, she put me on a special antibiotic and in about 36 hours, the fever was gone, and I was basically better, except that I had been in bed for 10 days, and so it took me a while to kind of recoup after that um, episode. I feel very fortunate because this can be fatal. This is your show. Your questions are key to our show discussion. Call in your questions about bugs or infectious disease or 
whatever we can we would love to hear your questions one eight 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 three seven six six two two five or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. Thank you. So this was interesting. It was, I, I have heard about our lichiosis, and of course this was a doctor in our clinic, a good friend of ours, who uh, made that diagnosis, you know, just read about it. I mean, that's how you do it. You know, you, you read about it. This is a Lone Star Tick. It's not in South Dakota. It probably is in South Dakota, but it's only been in Minnesota and the northern states for a few years. This, this is a species that has been well documented as being able to move north and further west because of warmer winters. This is a climate change uh, effect on, the, on this one. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not a really serious one. And we've got other ticks that are native here that we need to worry about, but uh, it, is, it is a species that's expected to move into the state if it's not already here in the southern counties. Right, I keep thinking about uh, Ehrlichiosis and that we get it from dogs, right? I mean, a Lone Star Tick, Ehrlichiosis, and there's a dog associated with that. What do you, what do you know about that, uh, Ferris? So, uh, it, it's one of these frustrating infections because uh, the symptoms can be fever, can be fatigue, uh, sometimes headaches, sometimes muscle aches, and you see this with, I, I can name 300 things that can do yeah. this. And you have, uh, you have a patient who's, who's not feeling well, yeah. and they're getting sicker, and the test for early ketosis can be negative within the first week, and then once you do the test, uh, most of the time it has to be sent to a reference lab, so it takes a few more days to get back. And some of these infections, uh, like early ketosis, anaplasmosis, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, you have to treat um, early. And you treat early, and if you wait until the test comes back, especially with uh, something like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, they found that the, the chance of dying from the infection is higher if you wait yeah. until the test comes back. So you need to keep something we call a differential diagnosis, where you um, think about different possibilities. And for for doctors, they have to think. Okay, even if I diagnose uh, the patient as a as having a virus, uh, ninety percent of the time that's true. But if they're not getting better or if they're having new symptoms, start considering other things and ask them again. You know, where did you go? Did somebody else get sick? Start getting uh, social history. Um, so in uh, in in her case, you know, if uh, if nobody asks where the, if she's been to Minnesota, for example, wouldn't have thought no, of it. Wouldn't have thought of it. Mm -hmm. And you have to start treatments. Uh, and start antibiotics just based on suspicion. Now, ehrlichiosis is treated with doxycycline, tetracycline, yes. as is Rocky Mountain spotted fever, as most of the tick Correct. Uh, yeah. born illnesses. Yeah, that's what uh, makes it slightly easier, is that you give doxycycline, even if you're not sure if they have ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, Rocky Mountain spotted yep. fever, and you wait to get the answers after the patient gets better, once you get the, the test back. Right, now uh, everybody, thinks about Lyme disease in the East for, and they blame everything. I mean, there's a lot of illnesses that they, they think might be Lyme disease and it isn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they treat with doxycycline and so on and so forth. Uh, do we need to worry about Lyme disease in South Dakota? In terms of uh, gaining Lyme disease in South Dakota, generally no. Uh, we don't have the deer ticks uh, in abundance in the state, and they've only been moving in in recent years. But if, you don't have to go very far east, though, into Minnesota and Iowa right. or north into Manitoba and further east in order to get them. And uh, so it's very easy for people that are traveling east and west, uh, especially if they have dogs or other pets that are out of the vehicle, out of doors, yeah. to, to be bringing in an occasional tick. Right. Um, but in terms of residents with Lyme disease, no, we don't have a, uh, a lot of problem that. here. We have an so. occasional, I mean, I've made a diagnosis with, uh, with Lyme disease. One yeah. yeah. And, and I believe there's been a, uh, a couple of uh, incidents in the Black Hills of the western deer tick um, Carrying. vectoring uh, oh, wow. uh, Lyme disease out there. But uh, I'm not up on the, the new statistics on that. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Most people who we see in South Dakota who have Lyme disease usually acquired it from, from after traveling, usually northern Minnesota, these wooded yeah. areas. The wooded uh, areas of Minnesota. Yeah, or Wisconsin, yes. Uh, yes. They, they get it there. Um, yeah. uh, so we, we see it sometimes, but to get it in South Dakota, that would be very, very unusual. Yeah. Um, we have uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, the, probably the, the 
it's not the Rocky Mountains that have the most of it. It's Georgia and... and uh, well, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever was first diagnosed from the Bitterroot Valley of Montana. And so that's, that's how it got the name. Right. Uh, and long before they realized it was actually continent-wide, so... Well, we've got questions and we should do that and we sure. do appreciate the questions. Uh, a woman from Aberdeen has a granddaughter attending college and heard that scabies might be going around her dorm. How can you prevent scabies? What is it? How is it treated? And so on. So let's talk about scabies. Well, scabies can be caused by several different things, but normally it's caused by mites. And uh, they, they burrow into the skin, you usually get them from other animals. Now, is chiggers? Oh, no, this, this is a different, different. Kind, different kind of mite. Okay. Yeah, and these, these are mites that will burrow into the skin, especially the follicles. And, Hair follicles. Right, right. And, and then irritate the skin and, with their feeding activity. Now, this is not head lice. No, 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 this is not head lice. That's, that's an entirely Another different story. situation. Yeah, okay. usually these are mites that are very difficult to see. Uh, and, and so the di diagnosis is usually this, the symptoms, the dermal uh, issues. And we see it in colleges? We, we see it in colleges. Um, if somebody living in the same um, house or, or room who has scabies, it can mm -hmm. be uh, contagious. Um, and uh, yeah, so we see it in, in crowded areas, especially. Right. Um, uh, usually people have very bad itching, so if you're not itching a lot, it, it's, it's not scabies. It's, uh, yeah, it's very unlikely to be And the scabies. classic rash or the ca classic characteristic to make you think scabies? Um, usually they don't have a very diffuse rash. Usually it's in uh, certain areas, like in between the fingers, uh, sometimes around the belly button, under the armpits. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a, a diffuse rash like the, the chicken pox or measles rash where you get okay. it all over. Yeah. Uh, all right. And people usually are not are not sick. Uh, they they have a very bad itch, but they're they're not having a high fever or anything of that sort. And people who have an itch like that will sometimes get a secondary bacterial staph, strep, yeah. MRSA kind of uh, infection. And that, that's a problem with all kinds of uh, critter bites or even just scratches. It's the it's that secondary infection bacterial from scratching infection. that is the big yeah. problem. Wow. So. Okay. A woman from Nebraska says, I have microscopic insects that I can't see in my clothes. I don't even know they're in, on me until I feel them biting. The bites are either perfect tiny circles or red bumps that resemble pimples that can last for days to weeks. Are these the same insects? How do I, get, how do I go about getting rid of these, this problem, especially if they are different bugs? This is a current condition, or yeah. Um, well, she's from Nebraska, and she has yeah. these non-seen microscopic bugs and bites. Uh, I would say, is she if she's not seeing the insects, she might be having a skin condition, and yeah. she might have to see a dermatologist um, to take a look at the rash. I would advise her, let's say she's going to see a dermatologist, to take pictures mm -hmm. of the rash because it might disappear. It always disappears before you see the, the doctor. The so, yeah. yeah. So, so get good pictures. Get good pictures, yeah. and and yeah. um, it might have the sensation of insect bites, but there might not be actual insects, especially if you're not seeing them. Uh, the, yeah, the, if, if there is, an, in fact, something yeah. feeding on her, there they will be seen, either by her or by her physician. Right. Uh, so if it's invisible, it's probably something even else. something as simple as as you were mentioning earlier, the dry, dry air. Well, or dry and, air, you're right, it yeah. could be. And skin cracking, mm -hmm. uh, overuse of soaps and hot water, yeah. you know, skin lotions are great. Boy, so, I, you know, that, that so. really does bring uh, to mind yeah. that whole problem of dry skin, the winter itch yeah. that we all have, and yeah. it's too hot a shower, you're getting under there, that hot shower feels so good, and there's not an iota of oil left in your body right. because you've soaked right. down and you've got hot water. Skin and is trying to readapt. Skin is yeah. just going, hello, <laughs> where is the oil? <laughs> so I like the idea of yeah. getting CeraVe ointment, particularly in the area that this woman feels is, is bothering her, it, it may, and, uh, and do it after your shower before you dry too right. long. Right. Okay, and so we've gotten you something to do on that. And actually, if you get CeraVe ointment, uh, you know, uh, it's going to do a wonder uh, for itchiness that could be from all sorts of things. A woman from Worthington received her pneumonia shot and had a severe cough afterwards. Is this related? What are the normal side effects of the pneumonia shot? Uh, so uh, the pneumonia shot is a, is a killed uh, 
vaccine. It's not a live vaccine. So uh, it, I, is, it is not a infection from the exactly. Shot. So I I wouldn't expect it to cause uh, to cause a cough. Uh, it shouldn't cause an infection. Um, so you could have an allergic reaction, but the fact is it is not commonly a cough, right? It, yeah, it's not usually a cough. You can have an allergic reaction from from anything. Uh, it's not highly. Um, it's not common with pneumonia shots. Um, the most common side effect with pneumonia shots is, is pain at the injection site. Right. Even that is not very common. Um, so probably there's something else causing a cough. Um, I don't want to make guesses, you know, but right. it's the winter season. It could be a cold. Or, we, but ch check with your doctor, I would say. Um, but, but it's not common with, with pneumonia shots. I really like the pneumonia shot, and there are two of them. And yeah. so at 60 or 65, get one, wait a year, get yeah. the second one, and get it. Uh, you know, yeah. if you get too old, then your immune system won't help you. So get it fairly early. What, 65 or 60? Uh, or? Uh, you can start at 65. My, they're giving it to children uh, now. And if you have any lung disease, if you have a problem with the immune system, um, asthma, get it. Yeah, get asthma, it. COPD, emphysema, um, get it. Um, get it. Get yeah. the pneumonia shot. I, you know, I, they say don't get the flu shot or the pneumonia shot when you have an upper respiratory infection because we have a tendency to want to blame the shot for the cold that follows. Mm -hmm. it, it could be that, and then you might not respond as well. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's unlikely for, for the flu shot to, uh, to hurt you if, if you have an infection and you get it. It's just that it might not be very effective. Additionally, it can cause a fever, a flu shot. Um, the body can react to it, so you might get a fever. Yeah. That's why some, some people say, I got the flu shot, but then I got the flu. You had the, some of the symptoms of the flu, which is fever, sometimes you get body aches, uh, but not influenza, you did not get the infection from it. Yeah. Um, so the general rule is, if you're gonna get a vaccination, be healthy when you do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a good way and, of putting and it. That applies for any vaccination. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. A man from Madison asked the docs if there is such a disease as foot and mouth disease found in children, and how would they get it, and how would they treat it? Um, There's the hand, foot, mouth uh, yes. disease. Uh, First thing is take the foot out of the mouth. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, it's children. Uh, I have a tendency yeah. to put that foot in the mouth. I've had that yeah. problem my whole life, but anyway, <laughs> sorry. There's the foot mouth disease in, in animals, yes. uh, and there's yeah. the hand foot mouth disease in, in humans. That's the Coxsackie, Coxsackie virus yeah. of uh, It's the a Coxsackie ch virus. It, a lot of children get it. They don't get very sick with it. Uh, it can be worse than adults where they can have really bad itching. And I had a friend who's, who never missed a day at work, and his son got it, and his son was fine. His son, I think, is two years old. Yeah. And my, uh, my friend got it, and he spent three days at, at, uh, at the house. And, <laughs> and he told me it's not just hand, foot, mouth. It's hand, foot, neck, Eight, head, shoulder, belly. Yeah, it's, belly. It, it's everywhere. Yeah. And now, foot. Now are all of those uh, fungi? Uh, it should be caused by a virus. The virus it's a virus. It's okay. a Coxsackie yeah. virus. So different, but it, you have sores in your mouth, uh, a right. variety yeah, of yeah. symptoms. Yeah. The great consulting detective Sherlock Holmes retired to the English countryside and began beekeeping. There is something elegant about bees and their society that attracts many of us. I have been keeping bees starting as a hobby for 17 years. I've been in the business of raising bees, I guess you could say full time or close to full time. Uh, for about seven years now. I actually started in insects in general. Bees grew out of my, my interest in insects. And my father was an entomologist with the USDA and collected insects and taught me to collect insects at an early age. Uh, and so I grew up chasing insects, playing with them, collecting them, actually pinning them and, and maintaining a collection. And when I was in middle school, we had a tree that came down with a birdhouse in it. And in the birdhouse, there was a large bumblebee colony. And rather than kill them off or have anything happen to them, I transferred them into a box with a glass top and put them in our garage and used a dryer vent to connect the box to the outside so that they could come and go for the rest of the summer and had bumblebees. And then I didn't have bees again until I was in grad school and was interested in trying having some honeybees. I had friends who had honeybees and they gave me a start in them and I started raising bees and moving back to South Dakota, I brought bees back with me and just kept bees here as a, as a hobby at first and it developed out of that as a business.
in South Dakota, most of the beekeepers are commercial beekeepers. And most commercial beekeepers in the country are migratory, which means that they haul their bees south for the winter. Most of them haul into Texas and Louisiana, uh, Alabama. I don't, mine stay for the winter. I expect them to just get through the winter on the honey they have and, and survive here. The danger for losing bees in general is that really Earth as we know it evolved with bees. Humans evolved long after bees and we are very much adapted to use things that are created or at least perpetuated by the bees. Bees are one of our predominant pollinators on Earth and many of the foods that we eat are pollinated by bees. In agricultural settings right now, we talk about honeybees because honeybees are the managed bees. They're not necessarily the best pollinators of a lot of the things that are out there, but they're the easiest ones to manage. And so we flood the areas with honeybees and use them as pollinators even when other things might do just as well. So the real risk is that if, if we lose all of the bees as pollinators, we lose a, a number of the flowering plants. During the summer, I get stung really on a daily basis get a sting or two almost every day. There are times when I get stung more than that at a time. I don't like getting stung hundreds of times at once, but that occasionally happens as well. My day-to-day -day in the summer is mostly painting bees in a, in a weird way. I raise queen bees that mostly go to queen breeders. So every day I end up painting drones that come out of there with color-coded so I know which hive they came from and exactly how old they are so that I can recapture them weeks later to use them uh, as breeding stock. So I put honey in my soup t tonight, uh, flavoring it. My wife always says, you know, you t test the soup and add a little flavor. So I added a little honey, thought, thought it would be good. It was really good. We had wonderful soup. My wife made the soup. I added a little honey, that's all. And did you thank the uh, queen bee for... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did not. It's a fascinating story, though, the whole thing about the bees being <clears throat> eradicated by, you say, a mite? Well, there's a variety of things that affect the domesticated honeybee, but uh, uh, the problems that have been identified within the last 10 years seem to be focusing down primarily on what's called a varroa mite and it's a predator in the hive. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, um, uh, other than just directly losing uh, the larvae and the pupae and sometimes the adults, uh, uh, the, the whole cycle of infestation uh, degrades the nest and, and uh, the whole thing declines and some kind, sometimes can die off. Now I know that uh, we use pesticides in our fields mm -hmm. and in our gardens yeah, because bugs get into our tomatoes and, and whatever it is. What's your sense on overuse of pesticides and is it similar to the overuse of antibiotics, uh, for example? In a, you're talking about in a garden situation? Yeah, in a garden or, or in, a, in you know, farmer, farming. Well, around here, use of insecticides in the dominant crops, right. corn, wheat, uh, right. soybeans is generally not a problem. If it is, it's usually because of misapplication and it's drifted off from the field and you know affected something outside of the field. When it's used carefully. When it's used, used properly and under the current and under the proper conditions. You know, low, very low wind and you know depends on whether it's trucked on or flown on or mm -hmm. you know the application method. Um, but most of the uh, residential um, problems with insecticides is overuse. That, uh, because it, we don't it, it's know the old much. problem of if a little bit will work, a lot will work better. And it's just like with antibiotics on viruses and bacteria, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's better off in most cases just to not use an insecticide at all, especially if you're trying to keep the pollinators, the bees and the butterflies and other oh, things around. Because, around because, because, because like they're those. very sensitive to uh, insecticides. Okay. And, uh, so, and, and uh, before we move to more questions, uh, overuse of antibiotics. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Uh, you know, when antibiotics started uh, becoming more popular in the 50s, doctors were convincing other doctors, the infectious disease doctors convinced other doctors to use antibiotics that they were beneficial. 
now we have the exactly the opposite problem. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to almost uh, all kinds of antibiotics, and some um, there are a lot of people dying from these uh, these bacteria that have become resistant. Very resistant. The, the bacteria are very smart. They they sense that antibiotic is there. They develop uh, mechanisms to resist it. Weapons. Uh, they change their own structure to combat that antibiotic that's coming to kill them. Right. I've heard, though, in, uh, for example, in Norway and Sweden, where they've been very careful and they've been able to restrict the use of antibiotics, yeah. that the sensitivities have come back. Exactly. exactly. And we can, so we have hope. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I always worry about is the overuse of antibiotics in animals in the veterinarian uh, deal. And I know that although there is an antibiotic that uh, is used, it's never used in humans, uh, that they use, and it counts for a lot of antibiotics that are used. And so veterinarians and, and uh, husbandry people say, it's not as bad as it used to be, and we're getting better. Uh, any comments about that? Well, um, not so much the uh, antibiotics. Uh, Ferris can speak better on that, but there's a lot of uh, uh, parasite drugs that are used on livestock that uh, are causing problems. In fact, we have a new funded study uh, at SDSU that's going to be looking at the impact of, of one drug, Avermectin. Uh, that's a time-release uh, formulation on, on uh, the impact of manure-degrading insects. Oh. Uh, and uh, we're not. Specific. We want those. We want those, <laughs> but it, but it also affects uh, uh, parasites, which is why the, the animals being given the drugs, and and so insects, biting insects, pest insects can develop resistance to some of these drugs as well. Oh, so. I, I you know I know we've dragged. It's no great answers there, but this is so important. So I'm I'm a take home message: don't push your doctor for an antibiotic. Say to the doctor when you come in, I know that uh, you may think I'm asking for an antibiotic, I'm not. Just give me the right answer right, right. and don't feel pressured by me to give me an antibiotic. If you say that, you have a better chance of a much better treatment. I'll, I'll even add to this, if a doctor wants to give you antibiotics, just ask them, it's, it's completely okay to ask, do I need that antibiotic? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you need it, take it. But uh, sometimes it's better to avoid taking antibiotics. Yes, it is. Uh, a woman from Sioux Falls has a relative who is a carrier of MRSA, which is methicillin resistant, a resistant or an, uh, organism because of use of an, too much antibiotic. What precautions should she take? Um, so they found that if somebody has MRSA, the household members who, who live in the same house might carry MRSA on their skin. Now, if they're not having any symptoms, uh, you don't have to worry. You don't have to take uh, antibiotics for that. Um, they found the best way to prevent MRSA from spreading is maintaining good hand hygiene. Uh, so a very basic thing, uh, hand washing or using hand sanitizers, that's the best way uh, to prevent it from, from spreading. So wash your hands, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, 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 do, do it long enough, a lot of water, a lot of water, all that, you get done. You can dry your hands if you have a paper towel. You turn off the water with the paper towel. I do that when I'm traveling. And then CeraVe hand ointment or uh, hand ointment that is uh, very nice, luscious, mm -hmm. and protect your hands from the dryness that can follow from washing your hands. Mm -hmm. Woman from Platt, South Dakota, lives in a farm home with animals in a strip, has striped wing flies in the summer and winter and found in the windows. Mm -hmm. Spraying mm -hmm. has not worked. Nope. How do you get rid of them and why are they there? Oh, that's a great question. Is it? Yeah. Oh, well, it's a, very boogers. it's a very common fly. It's actually related to fruit flies. Oh. Okay, and it's in the family that's commonly called the picture wing flies because of that banding pattern that is, is on the wings. They're very, actually very cute. Put them under a magnifier and they're, they're just cute. cuter than oh, they're just really <laughs> cute fly. <laughs> but they, they, uh, these are the adult flies that she's seen and they came into the house just like a lot of other bugs to overwinter. Okay, they're just looking for a warm, dry place to, to spend the winter. Their larvae are out in the lawn, in the gardens. They feed on uh, decaying organic matter in, in moist spots. And uh, they have several cycles through the season, through the summer season. And that's really as simple as it is. Uh, the adult flies are moving into the house for the winter. 
and as winter progresses and warmth, you get that balance of the warmth and the cold in the walls of the house and the yeah. windows, they, they gravitate towards the warm side. And if they find a way to, to get into the house, they will. And then they're attracted to the light at the window. And that's why you find them at the window. So. And they just fly swatter and now we're Simple about fly it. swatter, yeah. yeah. Fly swatters are wonderful devices. Okay. So. We had a question about influenza B. She had influenza B last year. Is she immune this year? Um, if you took the vaccine, then you are probably immune to influenza B, but you can still get uh, two other types of influenza. The influenza A, which has several types. Uh, the predominant ones are H3N2 and the H1N1. So that's why we tell people, even if you got the flu this year, still take the flu shot afterwards because you could be immune to one type. But not the other. But not the other two. Right. So, um, and they're evolving. I mean, they're, they're you know, yeah. you ain't may be immune to this one, but now the new one, yeah. get the flu shot next year in particular, will be better than we, we did this year maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe we'll have a new one too. Yeah. <laughs> a woman from Sioux Falls asked, I've had a cough for 12 days. I got tested for influenza, which came back clear. However, I was told that I have RSV respiratory syncytial virus. They have given me a prescription for Mucinex and steroid drug and a Z-Pak. Do you recommend anything else like a cough syrup and would you say Z-Pak? Um, if it's indeed RSV, then uh, the Z-Pak, which is the azithromycin, would not work. It actually sometimes can make things worse. I can't you know, comment specifically uh, on her case because uh, I don't know if her doctor saw something else. Well, there might have been a secondary infection going on, and that's why he gave the antibiotic. It, it, it's possible, yeah. But I can tell you, for RSV and other viruses, ZPAC, uh, don't do it. And I, 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 I really don't like the ZPAC. Yeah. It's the it's too quick, too easy, too easily prescribed. Everybody gets a cold. Here's a ZPAC. It doesn't make any difference except now nothing works. Yeah. Uh, the z pack doesn't work for sure. There's a lot of resistance among uh, strep bacteria. So let's say somebody has a sore throat. Penicillin is, the, is one of the best drugs to use. Um, not z pack z pack is not the best choice, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm not, I'm not criticizing that doctor of yours because you may well have had a secondary po process right. going on. It was a wise thing to do. But try to not get the Danic, Dagon antibiotic. Matt from Scotland, South Dakota wonders, what's the correct humidity point that he should keep the household? We're talking about the dust mites. I don't want to be extremely dry, but I don't want to have bugs around either. Well, you're always looking for an optimum balance that is always a, a moving target, but uh, um, my, my wife and I keep plants. Okay, and so we're, we're naturally uh, humidifying the house with those. And even so, we, we try and keep a humidity uh, range of 40 to 50 percent. Right. And I've heard that that's the, the, the best range to be. Have you heard anything uh, uh, at all, Ferris? Uh, Paul is the expert, so I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure. sure. <laughs> I think I yeah. take Paul, and of course that's yeah. fairly humid. Yeah. Well, but, and one of the things that you really want to watch out for during the winter, this is get not entomological so, so much, is if your humidity goes too high for too long, you have you could have mold problems if you're if the yeah. ventilation is not good. So, um, a woman from Winter has heard that poisonous spiders are making their way farther north, even to South Dakota. What do these spiders look like, and what are the symptoms if you get bitten? Well, as I indicated earlier, uh, there really is no such thing as a non-poisonous spider because that's how they naturally feed, is they, they poison kill. their prey. They kill their prey with their bite. With poison. Um, but most spiders simply cannot physically break the skin of humans. Okay, the, 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 the mouth parts are just too small. I'm guessing that probably what she's referring to is the brown recluse spider, which is moving north, much like the Lone Star Tick. It is moving north slowly as our winters, uh, average winter temperatures uh, increase. But they are not here yet. She's in South Dakota? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But she's, she's in a in southern winter. county, so, you know, it, it wouldn't be bad for her to keep an eye out. Uh, but even brown recluse spiders are, are very rarely uh, uh, going to bite a person, and most of the bites are never a problem. Okay. Um, right. But I, I might want to emphasize one thing always, and, and I know physicians have this problem. If you think you've been bitten by something and it, you have it, keep it. 
and bring we, it in. We bring it in. We need to see exactly what it is. I'd love to is. have that delivered. Speaking, so. uh, some patients who have a MRSA infection, it, it can look like a spider bite. So if you start having pus coming out, that could be a, a staph infection yeah, okay. of the skin. Yeah. I had a guy who I think had a brown recluse, and it was in a house that, uh, uh, that had been laying dormant, and it was yeah. late in the summer. And I mean, the bite was so uh, severe, and it was so bite-like. Right. So, but. Yeah. And, and realistically, we do occasionally get the spiders moving up when the people, trucks come in. Trucks, trucks yeah. bringing goods up to warehouses, people moving up. But uh, we don't yet have the conditions for them to survive okay. up here. So. We're running out of time. Quicker answers. We've got a, doctors reach a consensus on the treatment of Lyme disease. Heard prescribed two weeks of antibiotics to cure the disease, but I have a personal experience the treatment not effective, causing chronic ailments. So the chronic treatment, chronic Lyme disease, they use higher, longer doses, right? Um, you can go as long as four weeks for people who have meningitis with it or uh, brain infections or nerve infections with it. They found that a, a percentage of uh, people who get Lyme disease have a post-Lyme uh, syndrome where they can have different types of symptoms. Right. And they found that giving high doses of IV antibiotics even did not cure these Didn't symptoms. Didn't change it. So um, there's a, a strong opinion against um, using that. And they had meeting after meeting. They looked at so many different studies about uh, those symptoms after Lyme disease and, and treatment with antibiotics does not help. It, that's a huge point because there are people out there promoting their yeah. clinics that will give you huge doses of IV, IVM for weeks and months and months and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's malarkey. Yeah, it's malarkey. And um, there are specific labs that are designed to tell people that this is test will find your Lyme disease. They have a very high false positive rate. So, so they tell, me, they tell you you have Lyme and you actually do not have it. There are people who are preying on us, yeah. and we have to realize that there are shysters in the world. A woman from Oldham got a bad infection in arm. I mean, it's not that this lady doesn't have a symptom or a problem. Right. I would wonder if it's not Lyme disease, something else, and, right. and get. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got less than a minute. A woman from Oldham got a bad infection in arm from cleaning tropical fish tank, Mycobacterium marinium, right. was the name of the infection. How common is this? It's not very common. But it's associated. I've, I've had one case yeah. in my whole life. Yeah, it's it, it usually it's not an infection that starts very suddenly, but uh, it can go on for weeks or even months. Smoldering, smoldering. Smoldering infection. Skin mostly, right? Yeah, usually skin, and where the the hand, for example, was in touch with the with the fish or any any sea animal. Mm -hmm. um, okay, oh. very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question, true or false, ticks are insects related to the mosquito that can jump out of trees to land on humans innocently passing by. True or false? The answer is false. Ticks are not insects, but they're arthropods, not closely related to the mosquito at all, but rather more closely related to spiders. They don't jump out of trees, but I believe they fall out of trees, and my entomologist has corrected me on that and said that they can fall out of trees. I believe there's some data to support that, so maybe not the perfect quiz question, but the answer was false. It was Janice Willoughby who answered the question correctly via Facebook. Thank you, Janice, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. In a world where selfies are seemingly innocent, something lurks. And no one is spared. How goes it? It's flu season. When we say tick in the clinic, we're not talking about unusual twitches or the recurring beat of a clock. Usually, tick talk is about a group of blood sucking and disease spreading small bugs. Ticks are cousins to spiders, mites, and scorpions, and these buggers are not insects. Insects have three segments to their bodies along with six legs, while ticks have fused bodies with two segments and eight legs. Ticks are distinguished by how they grab onto passing animals and climb upwards to find a dark, quiet spot to suck their victim's blood. 
Common carriers of ticks are mice, squirrels, cats, dogs, deer, and humans. Entomologists estimate that ticks evolved into blood-feeding parasites about 120 million years ago. 3,500 years ago, tick fever was described by Egyptians. And 2,500 years ago, Homer wrote about ticks on Ulysses' dog. These bloodsuckers are found throughout the world, especially in warm and humid climates, with a four-stage and one to two-year life cycle before the female lays her eggs, starting the cycle all over again. At each stage, ticks require a blood meal. And be warned, most illnesses are spread by the tiny, smaller than a sesame seed nymph. Ticks carry various infectious diseases which they inject into animals and humans. Every year, more than 40,000 cases of tick-borne illnesses in humans are reported in the U.S., but the CDC estimates that 10 times that number go unreported. The worst news is that ticks are expanding their territories and the diseases that they spread are increasing. In our part of the country, we have the American dog tick, often incorrectly called the wood tick, which carries Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia. Nearby in Minnesota and Wisconsin, the black-legged tick carries Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, and babesiosis. In the Black Hills, Colorado and Montana, the Rocky Mountain wood tick carries Colorado tick fever. We encourage outside activity, but prevention should happen whenever going outside into grass, weeds, garden, or woods. In the spring and summer, tuck pants into socks so the buggers can't climb up into private areas. Apply tick or mosquito repellent on lower clothing and check for ticks at the end of the day. Remove these suckers with tweezers, pinching at the mouth attachment and gently pulling until she lets go, while avoiding squeezing the body of the tick. Antibiotics should be started if any rash, fever, or illness follows a tick bite. Spring is coming soon, so be prepared for a tick attack. A big thank you to our guests, Dr. Paul Johnson and Dr. Ferris Massanat. We must have bugged them enough that they would be willing to come up and join us tonight. Remember, wash your hands. If you haven't yet got to get a flu shot, there's still time to, that it might help you. This show will continue live on Facebook, and additional questions will be posted on our website in the near future. So. Listen to us. Go to Facebook tonight, right now. That does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. screening and treatment, what you should know and when. Next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, CoBank, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen District Medical Society, 
Black Hills Medical Society. Third District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison, and Flandreau. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee and Swift L Communications.